Right? If you don't like your job, why are you working, right? So, so listen, you got to get to know me a little bit before we talk about, or before I think you're willing to listen to my advice. So we're going to have a little bit of fun here up front. I'm going to share a little bit about who I am, my background, my journey. I think that helps shape quite a bit uh, about why you should care about what I'm going to share with you, right? Other than getting your credit from Dr. Professor Coolman Steelman over there. Um, so a little bit about myself. As Tyler mentioned, um, my background's in government. In fact, interesting timing, uh, we, you have a freshman here on, on, on campus, he's on the front row, Riley, and R so Riley Cox, his mom was my boss for six years, and so a lot of these stories we'll talk about, he'll have some association with. Um, so it's, it's fun to be able to have him in class here. That was one of my best recruitments is to get Riley here. Now they're an SUU family, right? That's right, that's right, okay. Well, I wanna be able to share a little bit about myself, right? Who is Steven, okay? So, let me just get this tested, make sure it works. Maybe not, it was a second ago. I'm gonna get closer, I'm gonna check this out. What did I do? There we go. Okay, we're, we're in business. Okay, so who's Steven? So, who knows where Delta Utah's at? Who's from Delta, Utah? Come on, somebody's gotta be from Delta. You were starting to raise your hand, what is this? Well, be proud. I'm from Fillmore, but my husband's from Delta. Well, that's great. You made a really good decision in life. You married a guy from Delta. That's great. So, so I was raised in Delta, Utah. Uh, relatively humble family. I love sports. Uh, my mom created just an incredible home for us. Family was everything. There's five of us boys, all kind of 15 months apart in age, and then a, then a girl. We joked that we were a basketball team and cheerleader, and, and we, we just had, I had the greatest childhood. I'd go across the street from my house, look for scorpions. I shot my first 22 from sitting on my couch, leaning out the window of my house. <laughs> uh, you know, just a great childhood. We don't do that anymore. And a lot of these stories my wife and I don't talk about. But, uh, but that was my childhood, okay? Um, community was everything. It's where I learned to value having neighbors. It's where I learned the value of getting on a mountain bike after football practice and riding at three miles to go work at the cheese factory so I had money to pay for my shoes and my pants because I paid for my own stuff growing up, right? So that's a little bit about me. Um, came to SU on a scholarship to be a doctor. That didn't work out so well. I made it to OCAM or close to that time period and I realized this wasn't cut out for me. It was actually a school of business advisor who kind of saw me on campus and said, I think we got a track for you that you're not aware of that would be good for you. And she provided me counsel and insight and I pivoted to become a business major, became a student senator here, had a lot of fun. It was back when business and communication centers were together. Halfway through my time in student government, we split that. And so I got to be the first official student senator in school of business. I thought that was cool. Um, met my, my love of my life, Pam Hendrickson, who became Lizenby from Tokerville. Our oldest daughter, Ashley, who graduated from SU in the spring, is now in Connecticut with her husband as he's doing medical school, was born here while we were wrapping up our school and we had big visions to go conquer the world. We wanted to be done with our bachelor's program and leave and SU had just begun an MBA program and they said listen if you stay the school will be free, we'll pay you as a teacher research assistant and we'll give you like 400 bucks a month and at that point that was like a million bucks. It's like that is a really smart decision. We'll stay here and we complete our MBA program here in the second year of the MBA program, which now is the largest MBA program in Utah, right? What, 700 plus MBA students here. It's incredible to see where that program's gone. Um, friends, family, huge part of college, right? Loved it. Go this way, I wanna be on that side. Is it better over here? Okay, there we go. I did tell them my left eye doesn't work, but that's cool. Um, just kidding. So then family, um, as Tyler mentioned, family's everything for me. Um, 
made a lot of decisions in life about well, what, what's important in career, not important in career, based around family. In fact, the decision to come to Southern Utah University was a largely uh, made based off of more time with family. So um, we, are, I mentioned daughter in Connecticut. We have a son in, in North Carolina on a mission, and we plan to have him come here. That's our plan when he gets back from his mission. And uh, we hope that holds true because we need him to come here, enjoy this incredible experience, find somebody to marry that's from Utah, so that when he goes on to his master's and graduate programs and PhDs and conquers the world, he'll have somebody by his side that says, remember, we got to go back to Utah and visit family, right? That's our hope. Uh, we have a 15-year-old daughter and 8-year-old son that keep us young. Um, that right there, that picture is Pam and I at a Valentine's dance. We organized an event, uh, you know, Valentine's dance. It was incredibly fun. We, we helped a lot of marriages, about 30 that night. Um, it, was, it was really fun. And then that was a trip we took uh, to Hawaii. Uh, interesting story, we had given our kids a gift to go to um, Disneyland for Christmas, the Christmas right before pandemic hit. And it was Saturday and we were supposed to leave for uh, um, California like the following Tuesday, it was spring break. And on Saturday we find out Disneyland shut down, not gonna take our, you know, not gonna accept us. So we got on the phone, got our money back from Airbnb, got it back from Disneyland. And we went to dinner with some friends that night. We're all disappointed because all of our spring break plans were just, shut down so right there on our date night we said we're going to hawaii and we did and we barely got home before it all shut down but that was our hawaii trip so as we get into my career what i'd like to just start to talk about is you know i think i'm going to be a little different um, in, in, in our time together but my career has been spent um, working with utah state government and we'll go through some of these awesome stories but um, I graduated from here, never thought I would be going to government. In fact, when I um, got my first job in St. George working for the Department of Workforce Services, my dad worked for the agency uh, up in central Utah. I remember calling him saying, hey, there's this job opening, I'd like to apply. And you know what my dad told me? That punk, you know what he said? He said, you'll never make it. You can't make it in government. <laughs> You're not designed for government. Don't do it. That's what he said. And uh, we became team members and we got to work together. One of the most precious experiences of my life is being able to work with my dad for about 10 years in his career. And, and I think what I've done is I've proven that there is a space for entrepreneurs in government. And I think those are the stories I wanna share with you today and help uh, maybe make a justification for why you can be an <laughs> entrepreneur no matter what uh, field you're in. So with that, right, government and entrepreneurship who in here thinks that those go together, right? Is that instinctive to say government entrepreneurship? Very few people would say that, right? When you typically think of government, it's bureaucracy, it's policies, procedure, it's not fast, you're not responsive. I mean, give me some sense of my, uh, the general direction for what you might think for government. That's what my original experience was as well. And I found that as I got into uh, a government job, that I had a real entrepreneurial attitude and I had to think about how I brought that to the job and I had to curate some specific skill sets to bring people along in the journey to help them feel comfortable to be an entrepreneurial uh, spirited person in government. And I think the stories we'll share today will speak for themselves that we've really changed quite a bit about you know, how government's operated. All right, so that being said, you can be an entrepreneur regardless of your industry you're in absolutely believe that so how many people by raise of hands are in this class because they're going to go start your own business raise it high I, I high okay so there's a fair amount of you that aren't in here because you're going to start your own business but the skill sets you use from this class will be helpful regardless of where you go okay so there's a few things that are really important for me i call it the you know framework for successful career and I've been trying to formulate the, how to kind of organize some of this, but really what it comes down to is your leadership approach absolutely matters. I'll talk about it in a second. Your work-life balance is an art. It's important to understand that and to, to treat it as an artist. And the third is your attitude shapes your outcome, okay? Uh, you know, who, who remembers that famous quote from our uh, football show, you know, attitude reflect leadership, right? 
those around you and the vision of, of which, how you look at what's in front of you uh, can totally change based off your attitude. I'm going to go into these um, in just, for just a minute in each. So the, I think what's f first and foremost important is your leadership approach needs to be transformational, not transactional. Uh, I'm going to just pick on somebody here, right, right here. What do you think transactional leadership means? Uh, making decisions of whether to discount the customer or, or how you would supply them or something to that effect. Yeah, it's a leadership decision based off of a transaction. Right? It's, is, is this going to make me money? Yes or no? Right? Is, is this per person getting the performance I need? Yes or no? It's, it's very much a black and white decision making process. Whereas transformational is saying, I'm not going to say, is this making money? It's saying, is this a partnership that could be part of my future? Right? It's not saying, is this per person accomplishing the performance metrics right now? It's saying, is this person have the, the ability to be successful in this spot if I invest into them and I build with them? So transactional is just, it's a quick decision, yes, no, move on. It's a check in a box. But transformational is, I'm investing into something that will be part of my future. And I think that leadership approach is really important, is if you're going to be ever tackling anything, start a business, a new position, whatever it is, how are you going to think about your interactions? Because regardless of your status and your title, you're in a leadership position, okay? So I think that's the, the thing that's probably the, the beginning of our dialogue here is, you have to be transformational. You're investing and you're building with others, not exchanging. So the art of work-life balance, um, three things. One, <laughs> make friends at work. Like, I don't know how to say that any simpler than that, but your goal should be when you end your, your day at work that you've got allies, right? You've got people on your side of the court, you know, working with you that you don't have enemies. It gets really hard to navigate work if you're creating enemies, and it gets really fun and easy to navigate work when you're creating allies. Just make friends during the day, and it's a lot more fun, okay? The second is, when you disconnect from work, you've gotta find that home, whatever that home is for you. If that's an athletic team, if that's a club, a religion, if it's actual physical location you call home, you've gotta have a way to connect with people and others when you disconnect from work, make those connections, and, and they're important. Be present. And, you know, my wife and I were talking about this last night. And she goes, "I want a little credit for this. I'm always reminding you. You should. Hey, you're home. You, you should be present." And, and it's true, right? She's been a great reminder for me that, listen, when I'm home and I'm with family, which is my evening, be present, okay? Because nothing's worse than trying to have relationships when you've got a phone in your face or you're, you're on the call or other things, like be present. And the reason is because that balance is really important. When things aren't going well at work, you need that home life to balance and support you, right? And you need to, when, when you don't find that intrinsic reward at work, you need to find it there. And the, th the third is you need to recover, get rest, okay, sleep. I, I, I tell people that directly work with me, when your spouse goes to bed, that's probably a good sign you should go to bed, right? Like just go to sleep, right? Okay, then the third, which is where we're gonna dive in, this entrepreneurial attitude, it's really about finding an opportunity, taking action, and seeing the impact. And this is my language, it's probably not the textbook language, but it's the idea of saying, I'm watching what's going on around me and there's a gap, there's a disconnect, there's an opportunity. There might be a problem, but as an entrepreneur, that's typically what you're solving, right? You're finding a product you can take to market, a service you can sell, you're finding something that's missing out there. And I call those opportunities, right? And every opportunity is a time to shine, right? That's how an entrepreneur thinks, right? When you see that there is this system set up for whatever industry you're looking at, and there's a gap, um, who's gonna fill that gap, right? When there's an efficiency to be gained in an industry, and you can provide a solution to that industry to increase efficiency, 
well, who's going to provide that? And that's what an entrepreneurial spirit does, is they typically go find a business, create the tool, sell it, or if you're in government, you don't get paid for any of that, but you make a difference, okay? So I'm gonna come back to this approach as we go through some of these stories of my experience, and I'm gonna to try to correlate my experiences to this model right here, right? Find the opportunity, take the action, make an impact. So the first division I started with in the state of Utah, I'm gonna go through four models, right? Eligibility Services Division, Workforce Development Division, Southern Utah University in the state of Utah. And that's where we're gonna spend my time is going through some stories of each of those four, okay? So, and Pam's laughing at me, is it because my finger doesn't bend? <laughs> this, is, this is so cool, guys. You gotta know this about me, right? You say like two, two truths and a lie, right? Well, it, it, my truth is that I think I'm gonna get them as a lie is I cut my finger off. I did, cut my finger off and I can't straighten it out anymore. I'm just waiting for the entrepreneur to figure out how to make that work. If somebody could find something, I can't straighten it out. So it's awesome to say, you know, four, is that really three and a half? What is that, right? Okay, <laughs> it's four. Okay, so the eligibility services division, I just got done with my master's degree. I spent a short time in another company. I get into the uh, eligibility services division and I, I get in and I have my interview it's the most awkward interview. There's four people, and I feel like they're conflicting with each other. They're asking me questions that are totally unrelated from each other, and it makes sense after I get my job offer. So these four were supervisors, and their manager calls me and says, hey, we've got this situation. Um, we'd like to offer you a job, but I have four supervisors, and they all want you. I'm like, that's not a, that's not a problem. Like, I'm good with this. And she says, well, I'd like to talk through with you what you would like most because these supervisors can't decide. I'm like, okay, well tell me about them. So there are four different things that you can do with the Department of Workforce Services. And I'm listening to this manager, <laughs> I can't believe I said this. I said, well, what gets me to your job the fastest? And, and she's like, great question. And she told me the answer. I was like so impressed. I says, yeah, because I'd like to have your job in five years. I was kind of being a jerk, you know, punk. I had her job in four, just for the record, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I became her supervisor and she loved me. Anyways, um, so, so what she said was, is go learn eligibility services. It's the most complicated process. It's data driven, it's software, you know, focused, and it's very complicated. It takes people a year to figure out the job before they're successful. Most, a lot of them don't even make it to a year. I said, great, sign me up, right? So instantly I jumped in, I fell in love with it. But what I started doing is I started finding problems, you know, gaps um, in, in services, you know, things that would, that if we did them different, it would make the job better. And I just kept finding these and I swear my boss is just hating me because they kept coming to them and like, what about this? If we did this, I think I could process 20% more cases. And, and the workload was based off of cases. An average worker had like 125 cases. I'm like, I bet I could get 200 if you let me do it this way. Or what if you did this? I could get up. Well, I'm here to tell you within nine months, I had an average caseload of 300 cases and getting all my coworkers to the same spot. So they were hiring fewer people, right? Saving a ton of money. They were giving us a little bit more money in pay, okay? But, but what ended up happening is after a couple years of this model with Riley's mom, we were able to propose an idea for pay for performance. We had employees making 10 plus thousand dollars in bonuses as government workers because we were producing more work. But the reason why we got there is because some of the entrepreneurial spirit I want to talk about. Number one, childcare expense tool. We don't have to go into details, but the process was complicated, okay? Somebody receiving childcare, we have to treat that as income, and they're getting different amounts every month, and nobody could figure out how to put this in to a model that was prospective budging. So what'd you, what'd you get for the last three months, and then how do we kind of forecast what you'll get for the next three months? Nobody could figure it out, and it kept creating all sorts of problems for the customers. We're giving them too many food stamps. They're eligible for Medicaid, they shouldn't have been. When quality control comes in on the back and they're like, workers, you did this wrong and the customer's got to pay us back. This is a real problem. So I figured out, how, you know, they, they needed something, right? There was a market for this tool. So I created the tool, 
kind of got a little bit of flack and I just kept doing it. And all the coworkers started doing it. We didn't listen to the bosses, just started doing it. Well, a couple months in, the state programmer is like, whatever these guys are doing, we need to implement in the state because their accuracy rates significantly higher. Our customer service experience is significantly better. So we took that model and basically sold it to the state, right? We up it, they took it and became a standard tool. But we found a need, found a tool and worked it through. Dual monitors, it, I don't even know if this group's gonna understand this, but when I started working, it was this, my monitor was deeper than it was wide. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you didn't just easily move them. You had to have reinforced desks to hold them. So we have like five different windows we have to have open to process. And I'm like, can we just get two monitors and go twice as fast? And nobody thought it would be a good idea. I'm a line worker a couple months in. We have this big meeting, this big state officials are down, Riley's mom's the boss, and I'm just quietly listening. And they get done and they said, anybody got any ideas? I'm like, well, I got a couple. And I see my supervisor manager like, just don't talk, Stephen. I'm like, here we go. And so uh, I rattled off a list of five things. And Riley's mom, Chris Cox, is like, those are brilliant. What do you do again? I'm like, my name's Steve Liz. And she goes, how long have you been here? I'm like, three months. She's like, let's talk through those. We spent the rest of the meeting talking through those things. One of them was, if you just gave us two monitors, because I knew the technology was out there, I think we could process twice as fast. And she thought it was brilliant. So guess what? I became the hero to coworkers because in the next six months, we all got two monitors, right? And that became a standard. And I remember, um, they went to some national conferences and all the other ag state agencies around the US were like, how did you pull that off, right? It was so abnormal to have two monitors in private sector, let alone government, right? But we found a need, proved the model, sold it, and they bought it, right? It made a difference for them. So online application portal. I remember sitting, you know, being assigned an afternoon to go downstairs and take intake appointments and you show up. And I got a young family and I show up and all the families coming in, they're, they're sick and they're coughing, they're bringing their kids in, they can't pay attention. Cause you got a single mom with three little kids running around. And so they can't pay attention. I'm like, I'm gonna get sick cause you're coming in sick. I mean, it's just, it wasn't working good. I'm like, can, can, and they had to come in like four times in person come in once to do the application, come back in for an interview based off the, what they filled out, come back in to show evidence. Like they just had to keep coming back in. I'm like, this is not working for anybody. Is there a way, and we didn't have, you know, online applications were not standard at the point. Is there a way to create a form where they could fill this application out and save us all a bunch of time? Again, major pushback, but just proved the market, right? And we tested it out with just a few communities and sure enough, they said, wow, that does save time. That saves traffic and lines in the office. Our customers are extremely happy because now it's a tool that they have that didn't have otherwise. We process faster because it's 25% less. We have to be in person. I can process the application on my free time, my downtime, not a scheduled appointment time, so I can fill in when I need. All of these things, and so we took it to market. And now, I mean, that's the standard, right? You don't meet in person for applications. And, and uh, the process was fun to kind of go through and test it out. Um, so youth program engagement, the, the interesting idea here was, is, you know, we, we had this idea that we would work with youth to get them prepared for their career. And no, none of you wanted to work with us, like your government agencies, why would we want to work with you? And so I'm just watching, looking, and I'm realizing there's no incentive for them for the youth. So I, I thought, well, I'm just going to quietly test this. And so I found a policy loophole that allowed me to give the kids 50 bucks, 100 bucks every time they completed something. And guess what? At that point, I only had a small case of like five or 10 because at that point I'd been promoted a little bit, but I was testing it. My case will became the biggest in the state because I had kids coming all over the place to come in. And, and our outcomes were incredible. Hey, go get A's, 25 bucks an A. Straight A's, right? Hey, go complete a resume building workshop, 50 bucks, boom. 
And, and, and so our outcomes were incredible. We're engaging them. And we found, right, that the market was missing something. The market was missing an engagement strategy for an audience that was there but didn't want to be engaged. We found out what that was, moved the process along, became state standard. Utah, within three years, became the leader in the nation on youth engagement strategies, and we've kept it ever since, right? Um, EREP software system, who here's ever, who, who can say this? And raise your hand if you, stand up if you can say this, right? Who's ever helped launch a software system that cost $80 million? Wait, wait, who here can say they launched a software system where they, okay, find me, right? Listen, $80 million software system, which is the backbone of the entire agency, it had been in the works for I think 10 years, there were $65 million into the cost and still didn't have a, a projected implementation date. Everything was going wrong. Typical government, right? So team, there's about 12 of us, started working through the process to really figure out what the market really needed, how we needed to get there, and, and hold ourselves accountable to get there. So then 12 months, we wrapped it up, got it to market, and then, and then we got ourselves out of the business of being beholden to the software company, right, that was making a ton of money every time we made a system change. So then we went to work to say, we're gonna build you out, and we spent the next couple of years building us out, so you tied out on all the software, and guess what? We took that to market. Right? We took that software tool to the other states in the United States and said, and countries around the world and said, hey, you interested? We own the product. Why don't you take one of our program managers on loan for two years, pay him a bunch of money because he's worth it, and then we'll get you the software system, right? So we just found a way to, what does the market really want? Get it done and get it to market because it be, had been on the shelf for 10 years. And what's the number one thing for entrepreneurs is if you don't have it at market, then nobody's buying it, right? Nobody's using it, okay? So we got it to market. Did the same thing with the contact center, found a way to simplify this model, and, and, and I'm gonna kind of pass that, and then, and then my case, customer portfolio, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass both of those. Okay, workforce development. So I'm gonna pause for a second. Am I convincing you that you can be an entrepreneur in any industry? Is this working? I'm gonna do my job? Okay, that's great. I'm done, okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, so let's have some fun then, now I convinced you. So who, we had a significant economic downturn in 2008, and tons, hundreds of thousands of people in Utah lost their jobs. So what we decided was, that's on us, let's figure this out, right? So we said, let's create 100,000 jobs in 1,000 days, right? In, in three years, let's get 100,000 100, jobs back in Utah. And we got all the different partners together and had to think like an entrepreneur. Put away the policy, put away the norm. What do we have at our table that we can pivot and adjust to incentivize that growth? And we did it, and it was an incredible experience. And that is what helped put Utah back in a position when pandemic and other things came along. We were healthy, okay? A lot of states never recover from 08, 09. And so 10 years later when the pandemic hit, they were still struggling to get back to where they needed, but Utah had already bounced back in a really healthy way. 25K jobs tour, we, we were struggling, even though we had brought all the jobs to Utah, we were struggling to bring jobs to rural Utah. So there were 25, wait, wait, wait. Who here knows how many counties are in Utah? Raise your hand. I'm gonna call on you. Okay, you're all in college, this is really embarrassing. There are 29 counties in Utah. How many of them are, big city counties, four. How many are small city counties? 25. Those, so, so four counties were having tons of success with jobs, 25 weren't. So we said, let's go take care of the 25. And we figured out with our math that if we put 25,000 jobs into rural Utah, it would, it would make a significant difference. And so we went and worked, figured it out. We actually got on tour. And the bus right there is, that's old lane in the background. Just happens to be that we came to Cedar with it. But we got all the service providers that could help create jobs. We put them all on buses and we toured the state. And we helped make the connections in every community to say, whatever you wanna try, let's do it. And we did. We tried countless different experiences in those communities to find what fit for them 
to help them meet what they needed and build it. Um, intergenerational poverty, anybody heard of that? Pam has. Okay, it's the idea that if your family is in poverty, most likely your kids will be in poverty. And Utah uh, was able to get the data to very specifically find out what were the determinants that we needed to tackle to be able to change that. We clearly knew the top four indicators of what would determine whether or not you could exit poverty as a child or if you would stay. And we went to work working with kids across the state, elementary schools, middle schools, to tackling those determinants. And the reason why a lot of you don't know about it is because we're tackling them, we're solving them. And within about four years, Utah went from being one of the states with the lowest um, uh, you know, uh, states with the ability to, to show um, success out of, out of poverty to being the highest. So if you're in poverty in Utah, you are most likely have a path out at this point, okay? It just, but it took us thinking differently about what the market needed to fix the problem and break all the molds. Um, all right, this one's a little bit fun. Who's heard of Operation Rio Grande? A little bit, okay. All right, so Utah had a serious problem, like, like world-recognized problem. We put all of our homeless people into like one square block in Salt Lake City, okay? And when you put your vulnerable homeless people in one block in, in a large metropolitan community, what happens? All the bad things happen, okay? So four uh, drug cartels eventually found their way to say, Salt Lake City and this one square block is where we bring our drugs and we offload to our mules that is our hub for the Western US drug trafficking. So what happens? It's like the worst senior hall in the world, okay? If I'm walking down the street, Rio Grande Street, I'm homeless, okay, for whatever reason, I'm walking down. I got the worst seniors, I got the four drug cartels, like you better pick a drug cartel, right? You better pick and you're gonna start using our drugs and you're gonna traffic our drugs. So now, all of our homeless population in Utah became a drug homeless population. It was extremely bad. So what happens when you have, you know, a couple thousand people on drugs that are homeless in a square block? Murders, right? It just gets worse and worse and worse. So what we had to do is completely think about how to break that up. Um, it, it, it wasn't working the way it was. So we, we brought a group together, created different areas of focus. And the first thing we said was, we're taking the space back, right? We called it the safe space. We took it back. We had uh, 70 different uh, law enforcement agencies come in and, or, no, uh, 11 different agencies and within one, multiple helicopters within one hit, 70 people, 70 of the worst drug people were off the streets within an hour. Got them off. Took over the space. We actually gated it put a, a, an ID badge system in it and, and created it and called it the safe space. If you're homeless and you need to get in, come in, we'll take care of you, right? And the process went from there. Once you got into a safe space, you know, we went, we went to the prison and, and jail, the jail systems and said, we're changing your check-in. If an officer is bringing somebody to the jail, we're doing a triage with them to understand why is it that they came here and if they were there because of homeless and drugs, they went to this path, right? And this path opened up a door where we created several hundred more uh, beds for mental health, substance abuse users, okay? And to take care of them. And that was our second phase. And the third phase was, once we got you to a healthier spot, got the drugs out, worked that through, we created an opportunity to work and created the dignity of work model. And that model became the life changer for people. But none of this, would, be, would, would had happened under traditional government. We had to think differently. We had to think, what does this group really need? How do we get this to market with them and, and solve this? And uh, I, I lived up there, felt like for three nights a week for a year or two, right? Uh, I stayed just a block away and there were a lot of really, really intense moments, right? But, um, but, but we changed things because we thought about them differently, right? Um, 
And since then, we tore those buildings down. Never a happier moment than to know those, those homeless shelters are gone. And uh, we built new shelters that are be built off the models we built. It completely changed the model up there. All right. So, so I'm going to bounce to this. I think we're about done here. And then we got a few minutes for time. I, I, I'm moving. I promise you I'm moving. So, so, I, so I get a chance to come to Southern Utah University. It's an incredible experience. And, and, and one of the things I was told was, hey, when you get to SU, will you shut down the Utah Rural Summit? And uh, it's just creating a lot of problems, a little noisy, will you shut it down? And it's like, well, I think rural Utah needs a convening spot, so give me a chance to play with it, right? So we played with it, and we thought totally different about it. It was a bunch of government people coming together, visiting, and we said, we gotta change the mix. Let's get 25% of the attendees to be industry, 25% education, 25% nonprofit, people making a difference in community. Let's just get them together rather than a bunch of government people. And let's find the most important topics for Utah and let's, let's put on display the best examples of how to solve them and then give a lot of convening space. Let's give a lot of networking where people can just solve things on their own. And we gave it a try, we're four years in. I think the, the average attendance was about 200 people a, a year, maybe a little higher. Uh, Monday morning, we have one in like a month. Monday morning, we found out we got 700 people registered. It'll be at 1,000. It's one of the biggest events that happens in Utah every year. But we did that by saying, what does rural Utah really need, right? And, and how do we give it to them? And we had to think differently and bring other people along in the process. We've had a lot of fun. And one of the coolest things was, and this is where Tyler gets involved in this is, um, we had some really cool energy going with the Entrepreneur Leadership Center here. We had the Business Center on campus, uh, just a little off campus. But they weren't really working together in the way that everybody had kind of hoped and wanted. And so as an entrepreneur, I'm like, well, let's do something cool together, right? Let's do something really cool that we can all put our energy into that can neutralize maybe some other things. And, 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 and the group came together and came up with the Stay Baked Business Challenge. And that has been one of the coolest things that's happened, I think, for the university in connecting with the industry. And the State Baking Business Challenges, I mean, who, who's going to compete for it? Who, who, anybody competing in State Baking Business Challenges? Really? Come on, be, be proud. All right, okay. So it's just such a cool experience. But that uh, was an opportunity to bring people together that had the similar goal and figure out how to think about it differently and you know, Tyler, we all had uncomfortable moments in the journey, right? Like what's gonna work and not work? But we stayed focused on uh, what, what really needed to be accomplished and we all made adjustments and, and came up with something really beautiful, right? Um, okay, I think I'm way over time. Right, Tyler? You got seven minutes. Total seven minutes. I didn't practice this. <laughs> in fact, we made the slide deck last night. <laughs> but, but I think the point is, we're trying to recognize that regardless of where you're at, you can, you can innovate, right? I'm gonna go back to this right here. No matter where you're at, there's an opportunity out there, right? And it's your choice whether you wanna tackle that opportunity. Some people call them problems, headaches. But there's a problem, there's a headache. I kinda of get a little excited because I'm like, I think I can be the hero right here Right? You ought to be thinking, there ought to be a market right here. When I have an experience and it doesn't go well and the industry isn't taking care of me, well, maybe I ought to find a solution that others can have to that market. Right? So every opportunity is, is, is time to shine. Right? If you have that mindset, you'll solve it. Right? And, 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 but it takes, you have to take action. You have to do something with it. Right? And you have to bring people along. Uh, there's a few things that I've learned along the way. Um, one is VIP people. If you have an idea and you need other people to, to join you along the way, treat them like VIPs and make it so that whenever they interact with you, it's a special experience. They'll want to be with you. Okay. Another thing is <laughs> you're always on a job interview. Always. Okay. He might be my boss in a year. You never know, okay? So because of that, you've always got to be kind to people. You've got to show up and be present. 
you know, I, uh, I presented somewhere last week and person came in late, goes to the back, instantly pulls his phone up and I'm irritated because I'm the keynote. And so I thought, oh, I can, I can own this and just keep it. Or I can change the situation. It's an opportunity. I'm going to engage him. I think the time together with this person could change him. So I, I intentionally find a way to talk about putting phones away while we're in meetings without putting attention on him. I don't want to be a jerk. He hears it. He puts it away. And then I find a way to engage him. Now he's engaged. Phone never comes back out. He wins. I win. Right? But I treated him like a VIP. I brought him, elevated him, gave him some attention. I was nice to him, right? And so these things are key for bringing people into your circle to help you take on the opportunities to take those actions, to move those forward. So with that being said, last slide, every opportunity, every problem is an opportunity to shine. I totally believe that. And I think we've got like three minutes for questions, four minutes. Four and a half. Four, oh man, I'm feeling ahead of schedule. <laughs> So, so any questions for a government guy that obviously planned two hours of slide deck stuff that, uh, that we'll be doing after lunch today. So any questions? Um, so just kind of curious, like, um, I appreciate uh, coming here and everything off the bat. Um, been able to learn a lot so far. Um, but just kind of curious, like, throughout your career, like, what was the most challenging, um, like, example of something challenging, maybe the most challenging time in your career, and how were you able to, uh, for me the most difficult time is when I don't have control okay when you're told by somebody or you're impacted by your environment you don't have control and I have several of those experiences and and that's tough you don't have control of the situation you're not making the decisions right you may not agree with the decisions that's tough for me and you know how I get out of it I, I find a way to connect with the people who are making the decisions to better understand their why. Most, most of the times when I'm not happy is because I don't understand the why of the person who's told me. So I go find out their why. Once I find out their why, I, tr I try to ensure I develop a relationship of trust so I can have conversation about the why. How can I be an influencer to either help them accomplish their why or change their why, right? Because I want them to see that I'm a champion with them. I don't want them to see that I'm uh, an employee that's creating conflict. I want, I want to help them accomplish what they're doing. I just don't understand the why. And I might have some proposals how we change the why. So always get to them and just say, I've never had a boss tell me, you know, I'm not going to tell you the why. You know, I, hey, I'm struggling to understand the why so I can put the right amount of resources or effort in. Help me understand the why. And then that opens them up so you can talk through maybe their adjustments. So, any other questions? Uh, why do you think like a lot of other states implemented some of those same homeless economic programs? However, Utah seems to be very successful with it um, in certain parts. So why do you think that is as far as like the businesses you're bringing here are helping it out? So there's a few key things in Utah. Number one, Utah is the highest volunteerism rate in the nation, right? We as a people in Utah know that we're a part of the community and we give back. That's a really important piece, right? The second thing is, Utah has been built on bootstrapping. If you think about it, the way Utah was designed, bringing the unsented people is like, like, go there, figure it out, good luck, right? But we have a whole culture of bootstrapping, figuring it out, owning it, right? Staying, communicating with people. You think about I-15, it's every 45 minutes, right? Like, and that goes on 89 and others. Like, communities learned, you gotta bootstrap, you gotta figure it out, takes a community to build it, but don't worry, you got two or three communities next to you you can partner with. So I think that mindset is still here in Utah. High volunteer, bootstrap, figure it out, but you got neighbors to work with you on it. Your hat's upside down. That's cool. I love it. It's probably worth more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems like a lot of your careers were focused on finding the needs that people have so yeah how do you find people that need the help 
Um, you've got to get proximate. If you want to solve something in an industry or market, you can't solve it unless you understand it. And so I think that's been a really interesting trick for me is, it's been tough on our family, like early in my career, I spent you know, three, four nights on the road, often at times for weeks on end, because I was local with the people I was trying to work with. And by being there with them and listening and spending time with them, you hear a sense of detail you wouldn't get otherwise. So that concept being, being proximate to the audience you want to serve or the market you want to take care of is really important. So, yeah. Deborah, Deborah Stillman. Okay, a VIP session. Okay, that's cool. You talked about the 25 rural counties um, and helping them. What about the rural counties in Utah who don't want help, don't want growth, <laughs> want to stay small? I love the question. So the answer is, you know, and I, I was intentional about what I said with them is, is getting to them to find out what they wanted and helping them solve it, right? So every community has a different value base and goal. And so our trick in the 25K was to find out what that was and to clearly understand it and help them with it. One of the problems that we uh, find in rural communities is they tend to lack the technical competency and capacity to navigate big problems, right? Um, they're, 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 they're solving their own family problems and historical land problems, but maybe don't have some of the rigor and training on how to, how to understand convening power how to navigate politics or law or other pieces. And so bringing partners together that says, tell us what your plans and priorities are. Okay, these are important to you. Now we'll bring the team together to help you accomplish those goals. And I think that's where we've seen some real winning. And we created the Utah Rural Leadership Academy for that. So one leader from every county in the state comes together and they spend a whole year. They understand the relationships, finances, and projects so they can go back and do what's most important for them so government isn't coming in for them. So are you meeting with like city council members? Is that the specific thing or the mayor? Or mm -hmm. who is it that you're meeting yeah. with? Yeah, typically your county commissioners, your mayors, uh, most rural mayors are part time. Um, you know, if they've got economic development individuals, key industry leaders, though that's typically uh, education. We got time for one more question. One more question. Yes. So I just want to know where you plan on going like in your career. What else do you want to accomplish? What do you want to push towards? What are you working towards? <laughs> That's a dangerous question. <laughs> Listen, I, um, <laughs> but very fair. Um, I didn't think I was going to be where I'm at today, right? Like when I left SU, I had no idea this would be the path I was on. My goal has always been to just be the best at my current job, okay? Because when you're the best at your current job, doors open and you get to pick. So my job right now is just to be the best at my job. And that means for me, everybody at SU who reports to me is so good they don't need me. That's goal number one. Goal number two, everybody on the governor side that needs access for support has that and, and that's sustainable and they don't need me. Right now I'm just a convener. So if I can get to those two spots that the rural Utah people don't need me because they clearly know where to go and how to solve problems, and all the people that report to me are confident enough to navigate what they need. I've worked myself out of the job. That's my goal right now. Yep. Okay. Okay, one last question. Yes. What's the grand prize in the State Bank Business Challenge? Oh my goodness, you guys. The, the grand prize uh, for the State Bank Business Challenge, it was 10 or 15. 10. 10. We brokered, I, I'm gonna go a little bigger. So we brokered a deal with somebody for $15,000, five to go towards student wages and 10 to be a cash prize. That's huge, huge. So compete, good luck, and go win. <laughs>